Hello everyone. Hi. My name is Donald Wesley and welcome to the Arizona Deliverance Center. Uh, we do have a donation boxes on the back of the doors. Uh, please, uh, if you feel uh, led to give, we would definitely appreciate it. We thank you. It's good to see all of you here, the Lord's people coming together. When the Lord, the Lord does say, when two or more come together, there I am in the midst of them. And he's a performer of his words. Did someone say amen? Amen. <laughs> she said, Amen. God is good. Um, so I'm going to get some of these announcements out of the way and we're going to get on with the message. Uh, we have on Tuesdays, uh, we have uh, Julie uh, Andrews. Her class is meeting at 6 30. Um, it's going to be ladies only for that class. She also is doing a spiritual recovery women's conference. That's going to be on January 20th. 2024, and that's going to be at noon. Uh, Brother Rick also has men's and women's Zoom service and uh, with, with the deliverance team. That's Wednesdays at 6 p.m. And every uh, fourth Saturday of the month, Brother Mike will be here uh, doing deliverance training to help give us more of insight into, into deliverance. Uh, tomorrow, uh, David, Baldwin, David, Baldwin, <laughs> excuse me, David Baldwin will be here uh, at 7 p.m. and there will be praying, deliverance, and healing that will go forward. Uh, the Lord is good. He's, uh, I watched uh, many people get saved lately. I was actually fortunate enough to, uh, to be in a truck. I'm a, I'm a truck driver, so <laughs> there was a guy that came up to me. He heard me playing the King James Version, you know, with uh, Alexander Scorby. I thought he was coming up to start trouble, and <laughs> but he wound up uh, he wound up praying with me and literally kneeling. We were kneeling down in the truck stop praying. And the man was, it was just a wonderful thing to see the Lord's uh, power moving. Because, you know, you never know what's going to happen, what people are walking up for, you know. But um, I pray that he does get saved. Uh, I'm going to read a scripture for you guys. And then we're going to get some prayer and then get on with Brother Rick's message. I'm going to go to Ezekiel 36. Verses uh, 24 through 27, where the Lord says, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I also give you and a new spirit and I will put, that I will put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of you and put a heart of flesh within you. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in all of my statutes. And you shall keep them and do them. May there be a blessing upon the hearer and doer of his holy word. The Lord is good. Father, join me in prayer. Holy Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we just thank you that we can meet here, all of us, your people, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ. And we lift you up on high and praise you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is, that is within us. Bless your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who redeemeth our life from destruction, who covereth you with loving kindness. So, and you satisfy our mouth with good things, so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. We thank you for your mercy, Father. We ble please bless and sanctify this meeting tonight. That, uh, your, that deliverance, preaching, and teaching, and healing will go forward. Father, that everyone here and those listening online will, will be changed and transformed, Father, for these are the last of the last days. And Father, you're calling people unto yourself, Father. And please bless Brother Rick's word. Let it go forward, Father. Uh, please bless him, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us all be eager to hear this word and receive it and let healing go forward, and Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you may be glorified. And we thank you for the work that you're going to do tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and all of God's people say, Amen. Testing, testing, testing. Welcome, welcome. Good to see everybody. Praise God. Deliverance, it isn't for everybody. But you know who it's for? 
Those who want to become disciples. Amen. Does deliverance make you a disciple? Oh, no. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's God's word. That's you yielding your will to his will. That's what makes you a disciple. What, what's deliverance? Cutting off the entanglements of the enemy. Cutting the snares of the enemy. Oh, having eyes to see the trap of the wicked one. He sets traps and snares for Christians. Oh, it says that if you hate your brother, you say you're in the light, yet you walk in darkness by hating your brother, you're in a trap and a snare of the devil. Paul said we're not unwise to the schemes of the devil. In order to be wise and be able to see, you have to believe God's word. Just like you had to believe God's word to get saved, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God only. You can't get saved by any other way than through the blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect life of the sinless son of God. Knowing that he is the first raised from the dead is a guarantee one day you'll rise. And so you live not for this world, but you live for the world to come. Oh, that's, that's how you become a disciple. But what is the reality of this ministry for the most people that come here? Your only reference of good times is times when you were in the world. It was times when you were lukewarm, but you had nothing to gauge it with, so it was your best times. So your only point of reference is to go back to those times, but those times are what allowed the evil sin to come in and the entanglements and the compromise. And so you can't go back to that life. you got to go on to the new life with Christ. It's a life of faith. It's the life of spiritual discipline. You have to discipline yourself. And then God gives you all these gifts. They're deposited in your spirit, man, the day you believe. But now you got to use the gifts. If you don't use the gifts, the gifts atrophy. They shrink up. Did you know that? If you don't use them, they'll shrink up on you. My son just blew his knee out, unfortunately. And just in the matter of a couple weeks, his leg is already atrophying. You're limping around, you're not putting any weight on it, and it's getting smaller. It's losing the muscle. The Bible says faith is like a muscle. you got to exercise your faith. you got to use your faith. You get a gift. How do you use the gift of God? You use it by faith. Oh, you get the healing gift. If you get a healing gift and you don't have any faith to do what the Bible says, the Bible says lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. If you don't ever use your faith to put your hands on a sick body and pray that Jesus would heal them, it goes nowhere and it does nothing. It's, it's just dormant. It's just waiting there to be used, but unless you activate your faith. Where does your faith come from? It comes from the word. And then Paul was preaching and he saw a man that had faith to be healed. You can see faith in people. You know when people are ready. When I'm preaching down at the jails, I know who's going to get delivered. I know who's under the conviction of God. They have a wake-up call. They've been praying and God wakes them up and shows them the depravity and the seriousness of their sin. And it's a wake-up call. And then someone comes with the anointing of God to preach the word. He, they know, hey, I was put here for this wake-up call. And then they come into agreement with what God was doing in their life through discipline. God disciplines those in whom he loves. You got demons because it's God's discipline. If you're sexually immoral and you don't stop, that means you surrender to a spirit. Sexual deviance is controlled by spirits. God gave me a vision one time in a dream. And it was a boy. And the dad was looking. It looked like a kind of like either. It looked more like a fishbowl, like a box. But it was symbolic of the television. And there was a woman in there. And it wasn't graphic parts, but I knew she was naked. And the dad was mesmerized looking at this naked woman. And it was only fans. And he was looking, and the little, little kid said, Dad, why do we have to stare and look at this woman like this? And the woman licked out of her lips like a serpent tongue. Satan was in the house. And when the dad looks at, at the perversion, the perversion now, he's let, as a spiritual priest, Satan in the house. When you're sinning and you got kids... Your wife should kick you out of the house. You're going to let these spirits attack your children because you're, you're failing. 
You're failing your family. You're failing the word of God. You're giving place to the devil. You're doing evil. Now, God will help you. Without God's help, you won't make it out of it. Without the power of the name of Jesus, the spirits won't go. So God's allowing it to happen because he operates off spiritual laws. And one of the spiritual laws is free will. It's the first one. I won't make you worship me. There's the second one, that you reap what you sow. And so now he was reaping. The son was now being exposed to the spirit, even though he was a little boy and didn't know why we had to stop and look and be mesmerized by a naked woman in his house. Oh, that's the deception of sexual sin. Oh, but so many people, most people, most Christians, they fall into sexual sin and they won't watch porn. But now they're 35 and not been married and they've had 10 lovers. You begin to have intercourse with people, their spirits transfer into your body. Their DNA can be found in your body. The two literally are designed to become one flesh. Their bacteria is in your body. It never leaves. And so what happens is your soul gets spread out. You become thin. You become weak, and once you do it and you violate your conscience, it's so much easier to break the conscience, to violate the conscience and cross the line. And the devil will give you the world to forfeit your soul, so he just keeps up in the ante. You need someone a little more charming? Do you want someone that, that goes a little harder in the commitment for a little longer? I'll give you that one. Hey, you, wanna, you need one that's a little more charismatic to get you to live an outdoor life and go hunting, fishing, and, and you know, the video game guy, he drove you crazy. He just wanted sex and video. You, you know, I'll give you someone a little more exciting. And so what happens, this devil will give you the world, and what's happening? You're forfeiting your soul. Because it says the sexual immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what the Bible says. Now, a smoldering wick by no means will God snuff out. He's trying to help you. He's trying to help you. I helped the guy on Tuesday. And he's like, man, I, 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 this deliverance can't be this hard. It can't be this hard. I got to manage every look. And I got this... Even when I'm not looking at a beautiful woman, I got this peripheral vision that's so intense that I can get every bit of absorbing her beauty just as if I was staring her down with my eyes wide open. And he goes, and I'm trying my best not to do this. And if I do it and if I look too much, just something triggers in me. And within a couple of weeks, I'm back to porn. And I was like, well, these are lust demons. These were lust demons. And these lust demons were so powerful. He had got saved 20 years earlier, and he based all his relationships off physicality, off intimacy. And of course, it's going to be exciting. Somebody new, seeing their life, how they live. Some are not exciting. You see how they live, and you know you got to get out of there. You get some red flags on some, but if they're pretty and they're nice or they're charismatic, they're charming, whatever the situation is, it's, it's new, and there's adrenaline, there's excitement, it's a, it's a fresh opportunity. You can begin to, oh, I hope this goes well, I, I believe this is the one, and you're operating in expectation only to fall, and that's what he did. Three marriages. Oh, and then after that, he got witches, Witch, full-blown witches. When Christian men sleep with witches, it's, some don't make it back. Some, that's the death blow. They give you mental illness, and the women don't have mental illness. They just got spirits. They're designed to take men down. I, I hate to tell you, but men are to be responsible for their free will, responsible to the authority of God. And when you are not operating in surrender to God, you're operating in rebellion, the devil gets the legal right to send you a couple witches, and you get sick. So he had that. And then we tracked it down, and he was molested at five by a man. And I said, okay, there's the spirits. That's how they come in. They come in through victimization. They come in through sins of the fathers, passed down to the third and fourth generation. They come in through when you open the door. And so you got, this is them. You have to kick them out. He believed me. And they were coming out like by the truckloads. By the truckloads. God will deliver you, but you have to have eyes to see. In order to have eyes to see, you got to want to see. And yes, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's a, the interdimensional spirit world runs the natural world. If any man does not have the spirit of Christ, he has the spirit of the Antichrist, according to the Bible. Your sweet little friend Emily at the office is not neutral, not being born again. She has the spirit of the Antichrist. 
She might not be operating in deviance and sexual sin and manipulation and gossip, but she is vulnerable to the spirit world. That's why you're not supposed to yoke up with believers. You can wreck their lives because as the demon wants to get you, he will go into those people destroying their lives to get to you because you've done things you shouldn't do. You're not supposed to have, you're supposed to win people's souls. And it says, hey, if someone says, hey, we bought this meat in a meat market, it was sacrificed to idols. Well, obviously those people aren't born again. You're there on a mission to win souls. But then it says, hey, if they told you it was offered to an idol, don't eat it. Not for your conscience sake. We know that an idol is nothing, that those who offer things to idols are actually sacrificing to demons. So for their conscience, don't eat it because you represent Christ. You don't want to you don't want to make them sick because of your liberty. So obviously we're to be winning souls. But when they continue to, I remember I had a showdown. When they reject the gospel, then it's over. And I had a buddy next door. And he, he was a good guy. And it was weird. There was two neighbors on our street that I, I we, you know, they're helping me with my house. And the one guy lived next door. He'd always come over to check the progress. It was me and my buddies building the house from scratch. And Got to know him pretty good, and, and we'd hang out, and the one just didn't like Jesus, and he got twisted up with some Mormons, <laughs> you know, and he saw that was a farce, and so he thought, hey, that's a denom denomination of Christianity, and so he just shut it all down, and he had a bunch of AA where everything can be God, and so he said, everything's God. God created everything, so everything's God. I'm God. You're God. My dog's God. Everything that has life is God, and this is the way I'm going to do it, but the reality is I, he had a little farming business that I would always preach to his workers when I was around. And he tried to rebuke me for it one time. I didn't take an offense. I knew it was a demon manifesting that hated Jesus Christ. And then one day I was leaving and his wife was into some witchcraft and, and uh, she had a clairvoyant, so-called clairvoyant. They moved into her, their house and I mean she, she had darkness on her. And uh, we didn't like hanging around with them. This is when I was working... 40 hours a week and preaching 20 hours a week. I'm tired. It's Saturday night. I'm going out with my wife, and they're at the door. And we're like, oh, we're going out to eat. We'll go with you. And I'm like, oh, man. Oh, jeez. This guy. So as I'm driving there, and they're following us, I said, today's the day. Today's the day I'm going to present the whole gospel. He's gonna, I know what he's going to say. I'm going to make sure I go through all of it, and I'm going to give him that last opportunity. And sure enough, I did. Ah, you know I don't believe that. I said, hey, listen, you came to dinner. I got the right to speak. So listen, I'm going to go over this. I go over it, and I said, hey, if you die without Jesus Christ, without this shed blood, you will pay for your own sins in eternity. There's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You're, there, there's, nobody ever comes. The fire's never quenched. There's worms that don't even die. Are you good with this? Oh, we're good with this. If that's the way it is, we are, they look, I mean, it was the spirits came to attention in them. We're good with this. And I said, okay. And it was a little, no, no offense to them, and I wasn't giving up on them, but I was like, there was some relief. Me and this guy were done. I was not supposed to greet him in the marketplace. That's what the Bible says. When they reject Christ, you're not supposed to greet them. You're not supposed to, you, hey, man, you get, Christians, they don't understand that. They don't teach you that in the church. The Jews could not go under the roof of a Gentile. It was against the law. When Peter had the vision of every four-footed creature coming down on a sheet and God tells him, rise, Peter, kill, eat, he says, no, Lord, certainly not. Nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth. And God tells him three times, do not call what I have cleansed unclean. And then someone knocks on the door and says, hey, Cornelius is calling for you. And so he goes, and he knows you're not supposed to go, so he brings a bunch of Jews with him so he doesn't get in trouble. And when he's telling them, the Holy Spirit comes down. Cornelius was the first non-Jew for the Holy Spirit to fall upon them, and they were all mesmerized. All the Jews are like, whoa, they're praying in tongues? They got the Holy Spirit? Should we forbid these Gentiles the baptism of water since they received the same Holy Spirit as us? And they baptized them. And when they're going back to Jerusalem and they're telling all the Jews, they're like, what? The first thing they say is, you went under the roof of an unclean, uncircumcised man? And then he begins to tell them the vision. And they said, okay, now God is bringing salvation to all men, the Jews, the Gentiles, everybody. But the reality is, the Bible says, come out from the world and separate yourself. Separate yourself. I watch good people fall. I watched my brothers-in-law get, get into playing darts, get into bowling, 
And they were pretty good looking dudes. You know, you're out there fit and decent. You're going to get attention from females. And now you're going to have to be able to stand your ground and resist. And, uh, I, I, you know, one went good. She got saved. And the other, I, I don't think it went good. It ain't going good now. As he goes to a homosexual pastor. That, that's scary. And you bring your kids there, man. You're in gross danger spiritually. Gross danger. And so, look, this world is not our home. I, I'm on a mission, and I'm on a mission with God. It's called the Great Commission. And nobody can be saved unless they hear the full gospel. I've preached to numerous people who have not heard the full gospel. And they have spirits in their mind. When you begin to talk to them, it's, it's, it's like that meme where, you know, people like the woke people do. You know, you start telling truth and they kind of brain shut down. They can't absorb the truth. That, that originates from hearing the gospel. And the demons actually try to shut them down where they can't absorb the truth. And they try to jump to one subject to the next. And you just got to be patient. And you got to reel them on back. And you got to let them use their own free will. They have to tap into their free will because once you start going into your own flesh or pushing your own will upon someone, those spirits will shut that thing down fast and it will be night over in that gospel presentation. I've done it hundreds of times with those type of people. And so, look, this world's dying. And one of the greatest things that I've seen over time is the way that you live and the peace that you have. I turn people around on the, on the job site. I got peace. My wife leads all kinds of people to the Lord because she has peace. She's not a big-time preacher. She preaches only when you ask about Jesus. It's the way that you live. Well, what's the way you should live? You should live with power. The Bible says, I did not give you a spirit of fear. Everybody's got fear. Am I good enough? Are my breasts big enough? Do I have a big booty? Big booties are in in 2020. You know, is my booty flat? And you know, how many guys like me? And dudes are like, dude, I need cash. If I got cash, chicks will come. Uh, I need to have a few boys to kick it with so we can crack beers. I don't like drinking alone. It's a delusion. This world is a delusion. And when you live in a delusion, you reap what you sow, and it's lonely. When you're having relations with people who don't love you, that, there's a lot of regret and sorrow. Nobody can fake loving someone. You can fake it for a while, but it's going to be perceived by the way that you're intended, by the way that you uh, look after someone else's needs, by the way that you're already thinking ahead of their needs and trying to meet their needs. All oh, love is an action. And so when you live in a relationship where there is no love, you begin to dry up, just like you got to use your faith, you got to use your gift of healing, you got to use your anointing. You have to be loved. We're designed to be loved and to love one another. And when you're living in a fake environment with fake friends and phony friends and, and just surface relationships, you're going to feel pretty empty when they're not around. How do I know? Because I've been in this ministry for a long time. That's how it works. And the devil is smart, and he gets you drifted off. And once you drift off and you start directly sinning sexually, drugs, smoking marijuana, will give you schizophrenia. It's an epidemic. They just had a big article how all these people in Mexico are losing their minds now because the marijuana use is greatly, uh, it's greatly increasing in Mexico, and they're, they're getting schizophrenia from this stuff. When you get schizophrenia... That's different than a lust demon compelling you to be with a, a woman that you shouldn't be with and making decisions off body parts and intrigue of someone rather than, hey, do they have the core values that I'm looking for? A woman should be saying, hey, could this man be the father and the provider? And could he be a spiritual priest and lead our family out of darkness and in victory? And if they don't meet those qualifications, then you should take a, a turn. And if you've got a problem with that, you should make a sharp turn. So we're going to use these gifts that God gave you. The first gifts he, he gives you is power. Well, the power is to say no to sin. It's supernatural power. Most people say, well, I said no, and I still felt it. you got to stand firm in your faith. you gotta, you got to now call upon the Lord. Draw near to me, I draw near to you. Then you resist the devil. You've been trying to resist the devil, and you haven't made any effort to draw near to God. It says sometimes you have to offer up a sacrifice of praise, meaning you might not have a song coming out of you. Some days I do. Sometimes you got to just offer it up as a sacrifice to God so that you can have 
some closeness and you can fight from a position of God being with you. If God be with you, then who can be against you? For he who didn't spare his own son, will he certainly not give you all things? He's already demonstrated the level of love that he has for you by saving your soul. He says, look, he makes a covenant. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll finish the good work that I began in you. There's no problem on his part. So it always falls on our part to make a change. So he gives you the power to do something that the world can't do. Then he gives you love. Oh, the greatest command is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you should love yourselves. You should love the life that you were given. This is precious. You only get one life. And a man is to live once. Then he faces the judgment. So you, I can't, oh, Lord, you know, I'm sorry I got caught up in super bikes and dirt bikes and hobbies. I know friends are in their 50s. They got hobbies coming out of their ears. I mean, it's like you go over there and the intrigue of hobbies is like, bro, I did this all through my teens and early 20s. Like, this don't feel right. I mean, this looks fun. Go-karts at 40. Uh, this looks fun. Having big trailers and going camping, 15 fishing rods and guns to shoot stuff up and a four-wheeler to break up the monotony of the day and nice grill to cook up some steaks at the evening time. That sounds great, but how am I going to serve people? How am I going to love people? How am I going to really tap into the value system of God? You, you don't really, you can't love a woman and you can't love a man unless you know what they love and what they're about. You just can't do it because when you come together, you support the person. Well, you support the pe person in their hopes and dreams and aspirations and desires, and you come alongside of them to try to raise that thing up and get it going. Well, look, if you don't know God at the level of service, then you really don't know God. And most Christians, by definition of these polls, they don't really know God because 90% of people in church don't do anything. I mean, like, oh, what's it going to matter if I fold some bulletins? Well, dude, you're doing something. That's what matters. You're starting with a little. If you're faithful with a little, you can be trusted with more. But if you place a demand, well, I'm going to wait till the anointing comes so I can be a preacher, international preacher. Well, the best you can do is a YouTube nut job because those people are always out there on their own and thinking they got the most grandiose revelation from the Holy Spirit, and pretty soon they're whack city. So what we have to do is be faithful with what you can do. You use your faith. Hey, you, you work that flag and get the traffic on out of there. You know, Go ahead and pick up some trash, blow some stuff. They, there's a need. Work with some kids. Hey, go work with these kids that don't have any dads on Saturday, man. Teach them how to work a hammer. Work them how to work a skill saw. A kid, a little boy, man, he'll come out 13, 14. He'll get some manhood. You teach him some skill. Teach someone to build something, and something comes out of you. All my friends that got into building things when they were, I remember my one buddy, Mark Hunter, man, he just liked to build stuff and wrench in his yard. Man, he's building all these grandiose houses now, and man, he's got extra cash. He bought my aunt's 50 acres just to go out there and gander in the, in the fields outside of Nebraska, outside of Lincoln. I mean, there, he's got fruits from his labor. He liked to build and create. You can't let someone just, no, well, let's play around on this computer. Just be safe. Just play games. Shoot, kill, die, murder, watch. Oh, don't, don't look at the triple X now. Spend all your life on this thing, but stay away from that one thing. Look, you need to see that thing is, is hey, I Google four or five things a day. I fact check. I fact check myself now on Google. Like I've been saying that like eight million times. Let's see if that's really true. I'm a, it's a wonderful tool, but hey, if you're not operating in wisdom, Computers put people in slavery. That's why it's called the World Wide Web. You will find a web of deception, and you will find a camaraderie of a large demographic of people who have fallen to the same scam as you, and you'll begin to normalize sin called pornography. It's going to be, it's, it's going to be so sad when this economy starts really going down. And, and if you can't, some of you can't remember, and some of you, it's real fresh. 2008, 9, and 10 was a reset in Arizona. Housing market went down 60-some percent for most of it. And, uh, and man, there was people who had nice cars who were driving things they scraped together. I helped a guy, and I'm not kidding. I talked my neighbor into giving him his car. And I said, hey, that thing's been sitting there for a long time. I said, I got a guy. This guy used to literally make hundreds of thousands a year and had nothing. And I'm talking to him I'm like, bro, dude, 
Come on, you're Joe Benino, man. Come on, you can go sell memberships at the gym. Get around people. Go be a waiter. People like you. You got stories. Don't sit here and wallow in all your losses. I don't even have a car. I said, man, I'm going to use my faith. I'm going to ask my buddy to give you this car. And here this guy used to have the newest Mercedes every year, every other year at least. Had a nice condo at Lake Point Towers on the uh, Lake Michigan in Chicago. That's where Sammy Sosa and a bunch of the Bulls and the, and the Chicago Bears lived. It was the elite uh, condo tower in Chicago at that point. And now he's living in an apartment with no car. But I said, look, you got to start back up. You can't just stay where you are. You can't just wallow in your sorrows and say it's over. He wasn't, I think he was maybe 50 at that time. I said, your life's half done. I said, it can be over if you think it's over, but you got to rise up. And just speaking life and just speaking the word of God, he had some encounters with Jesus. He got back up on his feet and, 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 and got prosperous. But the problem was it lasted for about three years. And he would call me every year he was in town, and he would be excited to take me out to a steak dinner, and he would talk about how Jesus saved him. And then it was a year in between, and then I haven't heard. Well, what happened? He wasn't renewing his mind. God gave him a second chance, and God said, hey, if the second chance, the way you see it, is being able to prosper again, I'll release the prosperity I'll let you know that I'm good. God will give you the desires of your heart if you begin to delight in him. But pretty soon the desires of his heart drifted from God to more of the world. And then the sin of the world. He didn't understand the spirit world is, is warring against your soul. And it wants to entice you to sin against God. He's the accuser of the brethren. As I work in the jails, what they do. When a prosecutor reads the case, the officer will write any charge. Like, hey, I went there on a felony warrant. We got him selling drugs to an undercover cop. I went there. You know, he fought us. He ran. We got resisting arrest. We got, he was yelling, and we got disturbing the peace. And then the prosecutor will read it. If he decides to take the case, then he starts making more charges. So you're arrested on these three charges, and it's called a page two and a page three, and charges just keep coming. Well, his job is to overwhelm you, especially if you have a public defender, or to get you to settle. And what he'll do before you go to court and say, hey, let's make it easy on the court system. What I'll do is I'll drop half these charges, and I want you to settle for this. And he'll try to get the person to sign a plea agreement to take what his offer is and to alleviate the pain and the potential of getting all these years that possibly could happen. Well, that's what the devil's doing to you. He's, he's saying, hey, look, you know, he'll pull back for a while. You know, my buddy, he pulled back the poverty. He quit trying to hammer his, his finances. He saw God was blessing him. And he said, hey, there's no need for me to fight. He's using his faith. He wants his job back. He's working hard. He's being honest. He's thanking God with all this money. He's doing whatever profitable with this money. He's not squandering it on strippers and girlfriends inside and drinking. And it was blessed. So the devil pulls back. And then he subtly waits for you to go from Holy Ghost power because when you're in faith, you're operating Holy Spirit power. When you're asking God to open up a door and to pour you out a blessing and something you try to do and lost everything, so God's restoring you, you're walking under the supernatural power of God. But slowly you get comfortable then with what God gives you. He gives you your mind back. He gives you the Holy Spirit power. He gives you this love again. And then you slowly treat it like it's common. Oh, I've met a lot of my friends. They, they treated their women like common. And, and I was like, you know, they're mostly, I grew up in Nebraska, and I'm thinking, man, there's, there's some good women, and you got one, and there's some bad apples out of there. And I've seen them. The big cities are full of bad apples. They didn't have no fathers, and their fathers cheated on their mothers, and they got some man-hater in them. And these things come out when life ain't cookies and cream. And when there's a fight and there's a need for forgiveness, they don't got none in them. I said, you better see what you got. Plus, you're married and you made a covenant. But nope, they become ungrateful. And the first sign of ungratefulness is you start going to bars. Oh, now it's bad if you build a bar in your house and that's drinking and, and living a lascivious life. It says be drunk not with wine, but be filled with the Spirit of God. But when you're out there in those environments, oh, what are those environments there for? When I went out, it was to meet girls or to fist fight somebody. 
And after so many drinks, uh, the second option was as good as the first. And it was no love. I wasn't looking for no bros to find some brothers and some new friends. I wasn't looking to meet some girls so we could hang around and be friends and figure out what you liked in life. No, it was all sinister. And they played sinister music and they gave me sinister alcohol to break down other people's inhibitions and take advantage of their ignorance for being in an environment that you shouldn't be playing in. If you're in those environments, you're playing with fire. Bars have, they're just a regular bar that's been somewhere 10 years. It's got dozens of divorces. It's got dozens of DUIs. It's got dozens of, of abortions. It's got miscarriages from women who didn't know they were pre uh, pregnant and drinking. Oh, it's bumping into people who have drugs and restarting a drug addiction. Oh, just a regular old neighborhood pub has got some blood on its hands. And you walk into that environment thinking you're just going to chit-chat and kick it with one of your friends from old, and it's going to be just fine. It says be careful what you listen to. Be careful what you look at. Be careful where you go. Why? Because you can find something you weren't looking for. And Christians walk unwise and ignorant, taking advantage of the love that God gives them, of the power of the Holy Spirit that's available, and then the soundness of your mind. And someone that loses their mind will tell you, man, if I could get my mind back or $50 billion, I'll take my mind back. Forget Warren Buffett money. I need my mind back because no matter what I get, if I can't control my thoughts, once the thoughts become uncontrollable and you can't stop the voices, you're on another level. You can be helped and God can help you. But uh, let me tell you, that's a fight. And the only way out of mental illness is fighting. You have to fight for the word of God. You have to fight for truth. You have to resist evil 24 hours a day, and it becomes a battle of a will. It becomes the battle of the spirits that are inside you, their will against your will. And whoever's stronger wins. If you remain in the Holy Spirit's strength and you remain in faith and you begin to push forward, you can get your mind back. But if you don't, we see them every day on the streets, and they're really hard to talk to, especially when they do fentanyl. I can only talk to them in the jails. I'm not above talking to them, but the Lord spoke to me. But I'm just going to wait till they spend six months in jail and come up out of their, sloop, their stupor. They'll sleep 18, 20 hours a day for months. And then when they come out and they finally come to, to the chapel service, then I'll speak to them when they get a chance to use their free will in their mind. Some people, they just lose their mind. They, I've never came into, you come into a big uh, dormitory where there's a few hundred men. They're watching TV. They're doing exercise. They got a basketball court, a little atrium for some sunlight. They got a little guard desk. They got their showers and whatnot. Big little open area, and they have a chapel. Well, man, they mock you now. They mock you now when you come in. There's God mockers who mock Christians. So I stealth them. I don't bring the Bible because I'm too proud to wear my reading glasses. And so I got my Bible on my piece of paper. So they don't know what I'm teaching. So I catch a few just off, off the surprise that I could be AA narking on or some sort of entertaining class. And I try to take advantage of, of uh, not carrying my big Bible. Because in order to read the Bible, I need the big old one. It's, I look a little, I feel a little ultra religious. Plus, the word is written in my heart and mind, and I can preach for hours. Because I got the mind of Christ. I got the scriptures memorized. I, I hear it and do it. If you hear something, you'll only remember 10% of what you hear. If you'll hear something and study it, you'll retain 50%. If you'll hear, study, and teach others, you'll retain 70 If you'll hear, study, teach others, and do it, you'll retain 90% of it. James chapter 1. Verse 2, he says, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Oh, the only way you could do that is with Holy Spirit power. Every time I faced a trial as a sinner, I despised trials. I hated trials. I saw trials as useless, worthless, a hassle, something negative. But now God's ways are different than man's ways. It says they're far above our ways. And so God works to change a man through trials. And what, what's the trial? It's a showdown. To see what you really want. Oh, will you be obedient? Will you really trust God for something new? Will you really trust him? He says, I'm not a respecter of persons. Whatever you read in the Bible, 
I'm not a respecter of those people above you. If I did it for them, I'll do it for you. But I want you to learn from their position and their attitude and their motivation. And they're no wavering. This is the people who got miracles, not the grumbler, not the complainer, not the backbiter, not the gospel, not those who just wallowed in their sorrows and drunk themselves into a stupor because they didn't get what they want. No, those people are not recorded getting miracles. It was those who believed God, and they knew that he was the source of power to be able to change, and they reached out for it. They wanted it, and God met them and gave them and blessed them according to their needs. He says, according to your faith, let it be done to you over and over again. So he says, you count it joy when you fall into various trials. Now, remember, the Lord's prayer is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the wicked one. Hey, if you're walking in faith and you're praying, the Holy Spirit will guide you. Pray in the natural, pray in the spirit language. You'll pray prayers and requests that are unknown even to your natural mind, but known to God because God knows the future. So you can delight yourself in God in this word. But what happens is the flesh gets in the way. Oh, sinful attitudes, sinful behaviors, Things that were passed down in the spirit world from your forefathers will cause you to fall into a trial. Job wasn't doing anything sinful. He falls into a, tr a test. It's a showdown now with the devil. It gives you an insight. Job gives you an insight to the dialogue with Satan and human individuals. And he says, hey, I, I think Job's, Job's got it. I believe he's going to cling to me. He's going to be able to endure it. Satan keeps coming back with more temptations and more afflictions that he puts upon Job. And God knows that the end result, that it's going to be encouragement for all the human world to believe for victory. And that there's victory when you go through the trial and you pass it. And Job comes out the backside with double of what he had the first time. So he says, when you fall into various trials, he says, you got to count it joy. And he says, knowing that the testing of your faith, faith is what? Your action. Faith isn't just what you believe in your head. That, that's not faith. So the demons do not have faith, and they have no doubt whatsoever that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. Jesus created those beings. He created them. They got no doubt who he is, but they don't have faith in him. Faith is the action. Faith is the obedience to what the Lord tells you to do. So he says this testing is coming to test your faith, and then it's going to produce patience. Oh, if Mike Smith was to spill the beans on me, and they, they asked, they said, Mike, what, what was Rick's number one problem? It wasn't boldness. It wasn't, he didn't have any faith. It was, he didn't have no patience. I didn't have patience. And he was trying to do something that only God could do. And he used to, he used to make me question some of the things he'd do. I'd come down, I'd lay out my problems, and I had some good cases. Now, I'm not coming with Mickey Mouse cases. I'm coming with some real problems, some real betrayal, some real, and he would tell me things like, man, this is going to be a great learning opportunity for you. I'm like, bro, you really want me to drive here from Mesa to come and hear that? Dude, you can text that. I got 10 friends that can text me one-liners of encouragement. I came down here for some Bible facts, some spiritual warfare, binding and loosing some demons and kicking them out so this thing goes smooth like butter. That's what I, and I was like, this is really it. Well, I learned. At one point, no man and no woman can take you to the place of developing your faith. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, that was like pulling a chainsaw. You know, just keep pulling that sucker until it fires, and it'll run on its own and give it a little more gas. You can chop some trees. But until it fires on its own, and you're just trying to get it started. So a minister is only trying to get it started. Good ministers practice what they preach. That's why I trusted him. He practices what he preached, and he operated in power. But at one point, you can only take a person so far, and then they got to get it from God. The Bible says, look, when the Holy Spirit comes, you need no man to teach you. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach you and remind you of everything he spoke. Does that null and void pastors and teachers and evangelists? And No, it doesn't. We need all those for the edification of the body of Christ. But at one point, to go to the next level... Oh, it's going to have to be you counting it joy, even though it's hard, even though it's difficult. It's going to take and demand that you have faith in God, and then you wait on God. And then when you learn to wait on God, 
uh-oh, now there's some patience because he showed up during the test. You, there was no instant answer. There was no quick fix. You had to work it out, fight it out. You had to wait it out. You had to love it out. You had to worship it out. There was something you had to continue to do for that manifestation of something negative to stop. That's why it was called a trial, to test your faith. But now, he says, the first thing you'll produce is patience. And patience, but let patience have its perfect work. Oh, God works through patience. God works through quietness. Oh, the first time, before I got saved, I blew my knee out. And when I was 23 years old, my fifth year of uh, college, and I'm sitting there with a blown out knee. I think I went to a bar one time. I was the biggest fish out of water. And I was just looking, and I was like, oh, man, I do not want to be here. And my leg hurts. I'm going home. And I walked home. I said, I'm not going to these places no more. And God was slowly cutting the world out. Oh, having your dreams uh, taken from you. It's over. Hey, it's over. Football was over. That's it. That's your last year. That's all you get. And then I got myself out of the world and out of that sin. And I just sat there quietly. I was tired of TV. I'm tired of watching football. We didn't have video games. It wasn't smoking pot. And God starts talking to me. But what I didn't know is there was another voice that talked to me. And I couldn't discern the voice of another and the voice of God. I knew the voice of God was telling me, hey, you need to live right. You know the truth. You have to obey the word of God. I'd heard many evangelists. I'd been to church numerous times in Christmas and Easter. Heard some fairly good presentations and some better than others of the gospel. But there was another voice, and it would say, well, man, what you need to do is make a lot of money. Man, if you make money, then you're respected. And, hey, you can do what you want. You won't be a clocking in and out with a punch card. Make money. And I didn't know that was a voice of another. So you got to go to, through the process. You got to go through a trial. It's going to test you. It's going to develop if you pass the test. If you don't pass the test, then you go trial to trial to trial to trial. And it doesn't stop to the day you die. You can be 80. I've met 70-some-year-old people going through trials and still haven't figured it out. That you haven't passed the test, so you got to keep taking the test repetitively. So then it produces patience. Now patience is going to do a work. The Holy Spirit comes in the quiet times. He comes through the peace in your mind when there's not beats and lyrics running through your head and excitement and going to the gym. Oh, man, I got muscles at the gym. People like me. And no, gyms in the 90s became nightclubs. I tell my daughter, I was like, hey, don't wear those shorts. I finally, after repetitively, I, please, I go out, I over-dramatize it. Please, can you put some pants on? Look at what everyone wears. He's, I said, we're not like everyone. You're not like everyone to me. And finally, she's wearing some normal clothes. Like, no, no, no. Anyway, you got to come out of the world, and you got to be quiet. You can't get quiet till you pass the test. Nobody can be quiet on a porn addiction. No one can be quiet smoking weed. No one in there ever could be quiet smoking methamphetamines. Nobody could be in the peace and the quietness of God robbing and ripping people off. Nobody could. So they don't have any peace. So when you don't have any peace, you're always looking for pleasure. And pleasure, the devil, when you go to where he leads you to go, and through the turmoil of life and having no rest, then he'll pull back on you. And he'll take his hands off you and he'll take the demonic weight off you because he told you to go there. And you find a fake peace in bad, sinful relationships, in drunkenness, in television. The average, dude, you stop watching TV for a few years and you go and try to watch one of these sitcoms, you realize this is all complete mind control. This is complete mind control that you would watch this idiot with these stupid jokes that aren't funny and they get, you know, the automatic laugh button so you go into some kind of psychosis like this is funny. And none of it's funny. There's not one funny thing in any of it. It's complete mind control how to live like an idiot and how to live without God and be used to it and comfortable with it. All those shows. But hey, you won't, until you come out from among them, you can't separate yourself from them. Yeah, then it will produce the patience. Patience will have its perfect work. That you may be what? Perfect and complete. It's in the patience that you become perfect. It's in the patience you become complete. And then that's where you lack nothing. 
So in order to get out of that spiritual poverty, you have to embrace the testing. You have to embrace the trial that's coming to you. If any one of you lacks wisdom, you don't understand how this works. You don't understand the Holy Spirit. You don't understand the Bible. You don't understand spiritual things. He said, let him ask of God who gives of liberally and without reproach. He'll abundantly give you godly wisdom if you really want godly wisdom. But be careful what you ask for. Because the minute he gives it to you and reveals the real truth, you're now accountable for it. Oh, man. There comes a point. Hey, 30 years ago when I got married and my wife started saying she loves me. And I'm like, oh. Not that I didn't love her. You know, I had a, some love in here and I knew she was the best. It just checked all the boxes. But I knew if I said I love you, oh, I was going to be accountable for all that. I was going to be accountable to do the, all the right things, and I wasn't fully committed to do the, all the right things. And I had never passed really any severe test in the spirit world. I, I was just barely saved. And so I had an elementary mindset. I had an elementary understanding of God. Therefore, I was blinded to the gifts of God. Oh, that was the gift of God. The Bible says he who finds a wife finds a good thing and favor from God. My wife is my helpmate. Oh, she was tailor-made from God for me. Oh, I hate to tell it to you. I know this is hard for anyone to fathom this. Listen to more than 15 minutes of this teaching. But there's probably not too many women that would be suitable for a guy like me. Maybe I'm not representing truly the old man. There's only a slight glimpse of it. But I was a knucklehead. My wife said numerous times, I wondered why I was still with you. If any man I'd ever dated ever said or did the things or lack of considerate, consideration that you operate with on a frequent basis, I would have left. I was surprised at myself that I didn't leave and run. Well, it was God giving her some patience. Oh, it was something supernatural. Well, I couldn't see that value. Why? Because my eyes weren't looking for good things. I was still looking for worldly things, thinking I'll get the worldly things. I'll accumulate all those, and then I'll add in the godly things into all the things that I need to be happy. And it says, no kingdom divided can stand. You can't build your life on the things of this world and the things of God. Those things are built on stand, and the devil has the right to send a storm and put a beating on it to make it crash. And when it crashes, oh, the crash is great. And there's suffering and there's loss. Divorces are severe losses. I mean, they're nasty. I've seen numerous friends. Over half my friends are divorced now. They're, we're all in our mid-50s. It's nasty. And the kids, it's all bad, man. The kids get shook up, especially, you know, when they're, when they're in their adolescence, man. It is terrible. They're not built for it. They're, they're built for security. They're built for the love of the father and the mother. And now when that's separated, there's, there's a lot of problems. So if you lack wisdom, you got to count the cost. If you count the cost and you go ahead and ask him, he'll give you liberally to all without reproach that it will be given to him. But now, uh oh, let him ask in faith. You got to believe he is and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you're asking for wisdom because you want the way out to get your old life back, you're not using faith to be the man or woman that God called you to be. You just want your old life back. That kind of faith don't work. That's a faith in I want what I want. The faith that he's telling you to pray is biblical faith. I want you to have your full way through me. There's a call on my life. I want to fulfill that call on my life that I would help somebody. So when I meet you face to face, I'll hear, hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Verse 7, he says, or verse 6, he says, let him ask in faith with no, no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea tossed and driven by the wind. For not, let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Sometimes before you can even pray a prayer of faith and ask God for wisdom, you have to go through some deliverance. I hate to say it, but some of the people with the most spirits are Christians who kept backsliding back and forth. They're loaded with spirits. Now, a sinner, the devil didn't have to load too many. They never did anything for God. They never, they never served him. They were never hungry. So just a few spirits can hold them captive. But when you begin to taste of the goodness of God, you're a threat to the enemy. When you're sealed with the Holy Ghost and promise, he never underestimates the Holy Spirit. And he saw all the disciples. He thought they were, hey, I got these guys. Two can't even read or write. Hey, this Paul, I got him killing people. He's my right-hand guy. And he saw the power of the Holy Spirit in the, in the believer. And then he saw what happened when the person would renew his mind. 
Well, to renew your mind, you have to be singular. You have to have a singular mind, not a double-minded. You get nothing. So his job is to bring all this confusion, all this double-mindedness, and it will just move in you. Those are spirits. You can get rid of those today. You, you should be able to sit down and make a decision of what you want. And through the power of God, you should, you should be able to press forward until you have that encounter with God and receive what you're praying for. And verse 9, he breaks it down. Oh, it, he's dismantling the world system right here. Verse 9, he said, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. Oh, it, it's upside down. Who does everybody love? Rich people. Oh, man, this guy was, I mean, what's his name? Jeff Bezos. I mean, he was not a handsome guy. He was uh, probably, I'm not an expert in men's beauty, but I would say it's average 50-50 best. Now, what has he got? I mean, some Latin singer, some actress, some beautiful girl, and walking around on his yacht. I mean, the world says, you got it, and it'll be your friend, and they'll love you, and you become Clark Kent, 1984, if you have this kind of money. Well, no, the Bible just dismantles it all. Let the lowly brother, oh, the guy that works the regular job, the guy that has nothing, the guy that never had a bunch of friends, a bunch of favor, a bunch of people that liked him, a bunch of opportunity, let that lowly brother glory in his exaltation. He's been put in a position for, to, to take off with God. That's what this verse is saying. And he says, let the rich in his humiliation Oh, the rich fall into all kinds of snares and traps of the devil. They have, they have such a, a, a battle to keep that money for themselves and not give it to someone in need. It's a hard position to live in when you have all that money. And he says, hey, go ahead and, and uh, glory in, in your humiliation. Oh, that's not a good, but the guy that's got nothing, you're, you're, you're God's right-hand guy. You're in the launching pad. You're ready to take off. He says, because as the flower of the field will pass away, no sooner as the sun is, is risen with this burning heat, and it withers the grass and the flower falls as its beauty, beautiful appearance perishes, so will the rich man also fade away in his pursuits. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. That Charlie Munger. Uh, Warren Buffett's right-hand guy, the two best stock market guys in the history of the world. Man, they had so much money. They were sitting around eating Godfather's pizza, drinking Diet Cokes, and they were playing with numbers, billions, like it was 50-cent pieces to normal people. Like it was bingo to the <laughs> retirement people down at the casino, Arizona. They were moving billions like that. But what happened? Hey, it all came to an end. A man is to live once and face the judgment. Money can blind you. And so if you're seeking the pursuits of the world and thinking once you accumulate all the value of the world and then you want to add God into that, that's, that ship is already sinking according to James chapter 1, verse 9. Verse 12, where actually this is going to be out of Hebrews. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved... He'll receive the crown of life. Oh, no, no, we're still in, in James. Blessed the man who endures temptation. For when he's been approved, he'll receive the crown of life. you got to overcome. Everyone told you this false doctrine that once you got saved, you were always saved? Why does it say those who endure to the end will be saved? Why does it say right here in verse 12, blessed the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved? You're approved when you pass the test. You prove what you believe. You prove that you're trusting God. You prove that you really want to serve Jesus. You really want to have authority over your own body, over your own thoughts, and so that you can have freedom to do what God called you to do. You, you prove it if you do it, and you prove it if you don't. But when you're approved by God, you'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. It says right here, those who love him. The Bible says, if you love me, you will obey me. And if you obey me, then me and my father will come make a home with him. Oh, the Holy Spirit comes to those who obey him. People who get born again in sin, they quench the Holy Spirit according to the New Testament. Verse 13, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. He's not tempting you. He breaks it down. I'm not tempting you. He's not the tempter. The devil is the tempter. Uh, me and Mike helped a guy. We used to see amazing miracles when we were with uh, 
Acts 29 ministries. And these two dudes looked completely normal. They were GCU students. I mean, they had their stuff together. I mean, they looked right. They were raising the church. And one guy, he doesn't want to say anything. He saw the deliverance. He pulls Mike to the side, and Mike says, hey, come back. These two guys want some prayer. Well, come back with me. And the one guy goes to Mike. He gets mad. Like, he's mad at God. It shows towards Mike. He goes, why did God give me this porn demon? Why did he do this to me? He said, who told you God gave that to you? He told me one time, oh, no, 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 no. God does not tempt any man with evil. He went over this. He didn't tempt any man with evil. He says right here in verse 13, he says this. He says, when he has been approved, he said, let no man, when he is tempted, say, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot tempt anyone with evil. He can't even do it. He says, nor does he himself tempt anyone, but each one is tempted and drawn away by his own desires. It was a manifestation. This guy was going to church. He wanted to be a disciple. He was at an Acts 29 crusade on a, on a, I think it was a Sunday night. He was a God seeker, and the devil lied and said, God gave this to you. And when he received the truth, he fell down right there. This thing started growling. Just growling. He was pissed. He'd been exposed. And the thing came out. Then his buddy, who's watching the whole thing, comes to his senses and goes, dude, I've been watching porn too. <laughs> like, I got one of those. His wasn't quite as stream. It came out like normally. You know, just starts, you repent, it just starts coming out. That, that was a stronghold. When you start sinning and you give willful place to the devil, you open yourself up to lies and deception. Why do you think women keep falling for these guys, the, the same guys? Especially, now it's weird. Before, women used to be upset that someone was a player, but now they're all kind of in the same mix, just playing until the, until the pieces fit together. They just both live like that. But before, women were upset when they found out they were double-crossed. And when someone wasn't who they said they were going to be, well, what happens? Sin allows you to be deceived. Sex out of wedlock is sin. It allows you to fall into deceptions from the wicked one. Not just that person's deception, but spiritual deception. And uh, when he came to the knowledge of the truth, then God set him free. When he, he had to hear it first, that devil had blocked this scripture from him. And he says this, God cannot tempt anyone with evil, nor does himself, he himself tempt anyone, but each one is tempted and drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So there's something in there. That's when you've got to deal with it. You've got to renew your mind. You don't have to, someone's like, I, that, that documentary came out from TV Joshua. I watched that thing. And boy, I'm still trying to digest that. But the one girl said she was over there serving, trying to outrun being gay. And then she couldn't figure out why that gay was still running. Look, it's right here. Yeah, he put the desire in you. He can put an overwhelming desire. And that desire can start computing and, and, and making sense instead of me. It was like this form appealed to everybody I knew. But I guess this form of a man can appeal to someone. But hey, you got to reject it. If you receive it in truth, it's coming out of your heart, and then it leads to constant enticement. You have to deal with it. It's a spiritual issue. That must have come down through the fathers if you first realize that at 12 before you ever open the door through gross sin, molestation, uh, pornography. That was a spirit that was passed down. And then it gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown, you die and go to hell. This is a Christian it's talking about. God desires that no one would perish. That's why he bore the sins of the world on the cross of Calvary. That's why the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for the remission of sins. How you get started is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Once you confess your sin, it doesn't tell anyone to know the way out. You don't really even understand the Bible. For me, I never even had a desire to read the Bible or any book until I got saved. God has to make you spiritually alive. You're not spiritually alive until the blood of Jesus Christ Christ washes your sins away and then there's a rebirth there's a birth in your spirit man that's where they get the term 
any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. He is born again. He is born from above. God has regenerated and made alive his spiritual man inside of him so he can make spiritual decisions, so he can receive spiritual promises, so he can operate through spiritual power, have spiritual wisdom. But my people have not. Why? For the simple fact that they ask not. And if you're riddled with spirits, when you ask and you're double-minded, you believe, but you really don't believe. Now you're unstable in all your ways. You're like a wave tossed to and fro in the sea. You shouldn't even expect anything from God. So his job is to attack you repetitively again and again with abuse and abandonment and betrayal and confusion and indoctrination from all this world system into your head so that when you try to reach out to God, there's all this confusion. The basic deliverance is to come back on some solid ground. And then when you're on that solid ground, you can endure it. Okay, I got to prepare myself. Hey, I used to get in fist fights. And, <laughs> man, you, dude, I loosened my shoulder up. Like, dude, I don't want to throw my rotator cuff. I went out. I never wore those slick penny loafer shoes. Like, I need some traction. I mean, this is Nebraska. No one was stabbing people, and we didn't kick people in the face when they were down. Not condoning violence. Uh, but the reality is, man, when you're about to fight somebody, you've seen people miss teeth knocked out of their face. You've seen people sleep for three days from concussions. Uh, you need to come to attention. Some people have never been in a fight, so you don't have any correlation that deliverance is a fight. You don't try deliverance. You don't come on down to the Arizona Deliverance Center to see if they can take you to higher ground, see if they can fix something broken in your mind or your will and put it back together. No, what you're going to do is you're going to fight for the promises of God. Jesus Christ himself is the deliverer, and he came to set at liberty those who were oppressed of the devil. A sign that you have spirit is there is oppression. What does oppression mean? I can see the blessings. I can smell them, but I just can't get them. I get up on my feet, but I just can't run. I can't keep the pace. I keep getting knocked down. I'm believing the truth, but all of a sudden I wax cold, and I no longer have a desire to discipline myself. I become weak for no reason. There's a manifestation if there's a spirit. That's what you need to be real with tonight. If you want to stop it, you got to speak back to the enemy. you got to speak the name of Jesus. you got to declare, I don't want this anymore. I want, to live, I want to fulfill the call of my life. When I was saved and the blood cleansed me and I spiritually became new and I got a new, uh, new heart and I got a new mind, then I was called for good things, something different. But I'm doing way too many things that are similar to my old life. And I'm doing very, very few things that are similar to the, the disciples in the Bible. That's a red flag that you've been infected with spirits. If you have fear... If you have low self-esteem, if you feel you've been dealt a short end of the stick because you're, you're, you're in poverty or you're barely getting by, you're barely paying your bills, or because bad things keep coming to you, the same thing keeps coming to you over and over again, you're in a spiritual battle. You're in a spiritual walk, and something's holding you back. Something's blinding you from seeing the scriptures that God is trying to teach you to trust him so you can overcome the adversary, that you can overcome the enemy, and you can walk in victory. That's what he's trying to show you. But the devil's smart. He, 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 there's some sins that are pretty fun, man. They're fun. Anybody told you that s drugs didn't make you feel good? They're lying to you. They make you feel good, but, hey, they're going to turn like gravel in your mouth. Sin's sweet for a season. Adulterous relationships, oh, they're, 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 they're fun for a season, but then they turn as of gravel in your mouth. Rip-offs and scams and quick money, oh, it's fun for a season, but it, no ill-gotten treasure has any value. Now you reap what you sow, and now someone steals from you. And now it continues because you led a devouring spirit because you were a Christian and you were, more, were accountable for more, and more was required from you. So when you let these spirits in, they don't relent and they don't let go. They'll bounce around on sinners. Once they find a home with a born-again Christian, that they are now on assignment to stop you if they can. And if they get you to yield and believe a lie, then they stop you. 
They get you to surrender and, and think that you don't want to fight and you got some Mickey Mouse lukewarm preacher that tells you you don't have to fight, that Christianity is not a war for the thoughts in your mind. It's not a war to discipline yourself. It's not a war to be able to cut some people off. I had to cut people off. It was 20, 30 years till I saw some of them saved. Some of them I'm still praying for to see saved. But I wasn't going to save them hanging with them. That's for sure. It was going to stunt my growth. So to cut people off you love, that takes faith. Wrapping it up. It's the go-to. Verse 22. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. We got to do it. When he says fight the good fight of faith, war the good warfare, you got to do it. Run the race to win the prize. It's not, a, it's not a well wish. It's not a sweet nothing. It's a call to action. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror, for he observes himself, he goes away, immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues into it, continues in it rather, he's not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. He's telling you how to get the blessings over and over in the New Testament. He desires to bless you, that you would prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. But he's not going to bless you. The devil will bless you in sin. He'll give you some money. If that's what it takes, he's willing to give you the world for the forfeiture of your soul. The Bible declares that. But if you want the blessings, he's blessing those who delight themselves, that, that walk in a hedge of protection, that walk in a position that God can trust you and use you. He can't use a double-minded man. He, he's going to get a shot here and there because God's good. He's trying to show you what your calling looks like. Kind of to give you a taste, hoping something will spark, that you'll change your ways. But he can't bless you in a sinful relationship. Can't do it. Oh, I don't need to be married. You know, that's the state made that up. No, God made that up. Oh, we're together. Yeah, you're together just like everybody else shacking up. And when it gets tough, both you can bounce. And there's no legal ramifications. Your stuff is your stuff and her stuff is her stuff. And you just hit the road and go two different directions. There's no, no connection. There's no commitment. Yeah, it says the two will become one flesh. Oh, I wish someone would have told me when I was five, when they would have went over it when I was six, seven, and eight. Oh, it was already right and wrong was already in me. I would have heard those verses. I, I had one. I had one girl, boy. I'll tell you, she looked like a million bucks. Well, I went over to her house, and I got the creeps. And I'm not even kidding. Her house was crooked. It was crooked. I mean, you want to get a sign from God. It was there. That was the last day we ever, we ever saw each other. There was no hard feelings on either part. It was a one-day encounter. That was red flags. I would have been able to see the signs if you would have told me. But what happens? My people perish for the lack of knowledge. If you don't know God's will, the devil can trick you. If you don't know, God helps the helpless. And if you don't understand, he's the way maker. He's the only one that makes the way. There's a way that seems right to, the, to a man, and the end result of it will be death. God is the God of life and life eternal. Okay, we can do this. You can be a part of some things. God's called you for good things. And seeing God's, I don't wonder if God's word works. It works all the time. Some it's going to take a while. They're, they're hard-hearted. Sometimes they got to see a miracle. Sometimes they got to taste a, a bad situation where the only way out is God. But at least I've given them the truth and been an example of the truth. Hey, God's word always works 100% of the time. But there's free will, so I don't always see the response that I want to see on the timing I'd like to see it. But there are times I do see it just like that. When I go in and I get a crowd of 20, 25 people, oh, there's people getting saved. There's not a doubt in my mind. I've never been to a service where it didn't happen in Maricopa County jails. You go out and hit the streets. I've never hit the street street preaching. And I'm not a soapbox type preacher. I'm just a bump into the guy type person as I'm walking around in the streets. But... I've never went out one time and not seen God move in the miraculous. Not one time. Well, first you got to get yourself right. First you got to get your own self right. You got to let God renew your mind. You got to you got to see this as a test. Your deliverance is a test. Will you fight back deliverances? How is it fighting demons? Demons are liars. 
They're working with lies. Once you believe the truth, they're grasping for air. Once you forgive people, they don't have any hold. Once you've renounced witchcraft and sorcery and hurting people, there's no doorways for them just to come in and send reinforcements when God's coming for you. You can dismantle the devil if you want to. Let's be honest, some people don't want to change. They put people above God. And they wouldn't admit they do that, but by their actions, it speaks for itself. What you do is what will be used against you. Oh, you know how much I love you, Lord. He's going to judge you by what you did. That will show him how much you loved him, not by what you felt in your heart, not what you thought in your head. It's what you did. Love is an action. Faith is an action. And so you're prepared for good works. There'll be no problem. Your faith going into operation, your, your actions will be good once you see the direction and you can hear God's voice. You'll be led by the Spirit. There's no problem with that. The problem is it's a fight. And the fight doesn't begin until you repent of your sins. You, us fighting devils, it, be, it makes for a good show. If I could have came out of fire, come out right now in the name of Jesus. Someone's demons are going to throw a fit. They hate the name of Jesus. Hey, they don't like being threatened to a place in which they have legal rights. So we try to communicate the gospel. You overcome. You, you talk about the blood of the lamb. You testify of what you've seen God do and what God's done in your life. And hopefully you've been listening to it and say, hey, I want some of this. This is what the Bible says. I want that. Hey, there's some lack in my life. There's some spiritual poverty. There's some pillaging that's happened in my life. I can see you're telling me this is the devil. I'm telling you that's what the word says. So if you'll stand on the word of truth right now and repent, all oh, spirits will come out just fine. It, people are the hard part. Demons were already defeated at the cross of Calvary. The power was already given to every believer in Luke 10, 19. All you had to do was believe it. Forgiving people, it's confusing for everybody. Nobody deserves it. First thing you receive from God. What you receive, you give. You weren't looking for God. You weren't earning God's forgiveness. You weren't doing wonderful things to say, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and give you a little peace more than you can ask or imagine because you've been doing all right. No, he gave it to you when you were dead in your sins and trespasses, when you had no knowledge of, of his way, his will. You were not regenerated. You were dead. And so you have to forgive people. There's people, they, trust is earned. People don't need to know where you live that you've forgiven if they've ripped you off 10 times. People don't need to know your phone number if they call and lie to you all the time. But forgiving them is, is doing what God called you to do. Praying for them, blessing them. That's true forgiveness. Praying from your heart. Hey, they need God. Well, you can see what they did to you, that they need God. That's evident. So now you Pray that God would come into their life and meet that need that they have. It should be an easy prayer process. But if you can't do it, it's a position that the devil has orchestrated in your life so he can continue to steal, kill, and destroy from you. And if you got low self-esteem, that's a demonic stronghold. You're a brand new creation in Christ. What does it matter who you were? Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. I'm not a Christian killer anymore. I'm risking my life. I, he's had near-death experiences over and over again to get to a new community to preach the gospel. He's not doing it to try to atone for his sins. He said, I am what I am by the grace of God. He didn't walk around like, oh, Lord, that's why those guys beat me. I'm such a bad Christian. That's not found in Scripture. He understood the second chance that he got through Jesus Christ. He understood mercy. He understood the blood of Jesus Christ. It was the payment for his sins. He could never pay for his own sins. He realized that now there was a call on his life, and he got a second chance, and he was going to grab it with two hands. No matter where it took him, he wasn't letting go. He was the most powerful preacher that ever walked the planet. In my opinion, I, again, maybe we get to heaven, I'll bump into someone else. But, man, he did this thing. Four times, whipped 40 lashes, minus one, beaten with rods, beaten with stones, shipwrecked three times, bitten with vipers, endangered of wild beasts, of Jews, of Gentiles. He kept going. Two hands on it. Oh, I'm not letting go after what you did for me, giving me a second chance. This kind of mercy grabs a hold of it. 
That's what I say you do tonight. I'll show you how to do it. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the wonderful good news of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the only begotten of the Father. Oh, thank you, Jesus. It was your will to come. It was your will to come. And Lord, thank you that you lived this sinless life, Lord. The life I was required to live, I failed miserably, Lord. I have been sinning, Lord. I've been double-minded. I've, I've been weighted down by the cares of this world. I've been indoctrinated with fleshly desires as though they're common. Lord, have mercy on my soul. I'm sorry. Sorry, I didn't grab a hold of this thing like Paul with two hands. I, I grabbed a hold of it loosely. I didn't understand it was a spiritual battle to test me, to test my faith. I'm sorry, Lord, when I let you down and I yielded to sin and I gave place to sin. I apologize to you, Lord, as I've been taking offense with people. I've been let down and, and I've been discouraged. And now it's spreading to all kinds of people I've never even met. It, it is now making assumptions on people I know no idea what's in their mind. And I'm already making these assumptions, putting them in these big blocks of categories of people that I won't be able to help and won't be able to help me. I apologize for this. I, I, I've been controlled in my mind. I've been controlled with negativity. I'm apologizing to you, Lord. I want my mind back tonight. Lord, if, if, if I could just get my mind back, Lord, I'd be so grateful just to be able to have some peace and just, just be able to go over the scriptures without some sort of pressure telling me to rush through the scriptures. If I could just sit down and glean from the word and grow in godliness and then get up on my feet and just walk it out in my life, Lord, I'd be so grateful. And, and I know it's your will. So I'm asking, Lord, for Holy Spirit wisdom tonight, that I would fight a good fight of faith. I pray you'd show me how to do it, Lord. And before I do it, Lord, I pray that wisdom would go into operation right now, and you'd show me how to really repent for my life. I'm sorry, Lord. I've been jealous. I've been jealous of other Christians. I've wondered why everything seems to go so well for them, and nothing seems to go well for me. And, Lord, what I've been doing is I've been covetous. I've been coveting their life. I've been coveting their, their husband. I've been coveting their children. That's, that's a violation of your word. And what that is is a manifestation of ungratefulness for what I have. Please forgive me for being ungrateful for what I have. I got a life, and I got, I got Jesus as Lord and Savior. I, I, I got the word of God, and I, I got the Holy Spirit. I, I got everything, Lord. I've been disgruntled because I lost some money, and this test keeps coming to me again and again. It seems like every year it's coming back, and I can see now that I was blinded that this was a war. So I apologize, Lord, for not asking for eyes to see. I, I just walked into this Christianity like I could walk in aimlessly, and everything would just be all right, and it would just work itself out. No, I can look now that the Word of God is the law of liberty, that we would know the truth, we would know your Word, and the Word would set us free. Tonight, I'm making a commitment to walk by your word. And I'm going to trust in your power to do it in a way I've never been able to do it through Holy Ghost power. I'm praying tonight I walk out of here with my eyes open to see how good you are and how wonderful the time where I'm living in in these last days to help people and to share the glorious good news and see you work miracles through my ministry to be with me and never leaving me and never forsake me, Lord. Thank you so much. I forgive myself for my failures. I forgive myself for believing lies. I forgive my family, and I forgive people in my family who cursed me and wished I'd die, wished I was never born. I forgive the people who consider me a disappointment to the family, and they label me as a failure. They expect nothing out of me, and any time I say anything good, they brush it off like it's unbelievable like the rest of my life, and I forgive them for it, Lord. I forgive them, Lord Jesus, and I don't want to do this to show them, Lord, I, I want you to be with me so I can just love them and, 
be an example to them. I'll, I'll bless them right now, and I release them from their curses, and I release them from their sins right now in Jesus' name. For the people who lied to me and broke my heart, to the people who violated me sexually and pushed me into sexual encounters in which I wasn't comfortable with and manipulated me to make me feel that if I didn't do it, they'd leave me. And I loved them and wanted to be with them, and so they led me to the compromise. I forgive them in Jesus' name. I forgive my friends that introduced me to drugs and introduced me to an addictive lifestyle, and they knew it was dangerous because they were addicted. I forgive them and I know that it wasn't them, it was the spirits in operation working right through them. And so I hate drug addiction, and I hate drug demons, and I want to be free from them. I want to be a free from offense tonight, Lord. And I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that performs the Word of God. Tonight I'm going to stand on the Word of God. I thank you tonight you're going to perform the Word of God through delivering me from the oppressor. And giving me my mind back, I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. And if that's you, come on to the front. You can line up between that black mat and that carpet, and we're going to pray for you as a ministry team. And you can receive this freedom. Oh, it says deliverance is the children's bread. The only people that have the right to partake of it is a born-again believer. You just have to use your faith. You got to tell God you want it. You got to stand your ground and you got to say, I'm not taking no for an answer. God said he wanted to help me and that's just the way it is. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for touching everyone. Thank you for touching their minds. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, let the Holy Spirit come on in. He'll just unwind these spirits in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that we can get our minds back. I'm not going to fight with my intellect. I'm going to fight with my faith in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Satan, you're bound. Satan, you come out right now. Satan, we do not allow you right now. I command you to come out of there right now. Mental illness, come out of there right now. Bitterness, resentment, fighting, discouragement, despair, loneliness, regret, anger, and hatred. Come out of that body right now. Come out of there. I command you by the authority of the name, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Devil, you were defeated at the cross of Calvary. And now we loose you by the name of Jesus. Come out of there right now. Come out of there. All that offense from people that let them down. All the offense and the bitterness. All those devils that try to trick them and turn the war against themselves through depression. I command depression to come out right now. Come out of there, you oppressor. You've been sucking the light of Christ right out of this man. And I command you to let, let this man go right now in Jesus' name. Take a big breath. Come out of there right now. I command this oppressive spirit to come out right now. Come out of there right now. Come out of there right now. Come out of there right now. In Jesus' holy name, I'm going to leave here free. I'm leaving this sin behind. I'm leaving this sin right, right now. I'm leaving it right here at the altar, devil. In the name of Jesus, I command this anger to go. I command this anger to go right now. Anger against my dad. Anger against myself. I bind your power. Come out of there. Come out of there. Come out of there right now. Come out of there. Come out of there right now. Come out of there, you choker. You're trying to choke Jesus out of there. Come out right now. Come out of there. You're trying to choke his anointing, telling him God didn't give him an anointing. Come out of there right now. You're trying to choke out his spiritual discipline that comes from the Father. Come out of there. Come out of there. I charge you in the name of Jesus. You are a spirit that tried to make him compromise again and again. You're trying to bring that weak willedness to him. I break you in the name of Jesus. Come out of there. Just let your tears go. He'll deliver you through tears. Come out of there. Let him go in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Just let your tears go. Let that guilt go. Let that guilt go in Jesus' name. He forgives you. The blood of Jesus, the minute you confessed it, the blood of Jesus washed it into the sea of forgetfulness. Now let this demon drive him out now. He doesn't want you to be forgiven. 
He doesn't want you to feel the cleansing. He tells you don't deserve it because you didn't do it numerous times. He's a liar. God is the God of many chances. Thank you, Jesus, for these tears. Thank you for the tears, Lord. You're softening his heart. You're giving him that soft heart to receive from God. Thank you. We receive the deliverance right now in Jesus' name. Girl, go. Come out of there right now. There he goes. Anger, come out of there. I'm tired of being angry. I'm tired of being angry. Come out of there. There you go. Let your tears go. Don't stop them. Keep going, sir. Keep going. In the name of Jesus, come out of there. Come out of there right now. Stubborn spirits. Rebellious spirits. I command you to loose right now. Come out of there right now. Stubbornness and rebellion. I command you to come out right now. Come out of there right now. There you go. Stubbornness. You come out now. Stubbornness. Rebelling against the word of God. Rebelling, rebelling against the discipline of God. The testing of the faith. Come out right now. You're trying to hold her. There you go. Come out, you hold. Come out of there right now. It says, count it all joy as we face trials of many kinds. Those were sent there to refine her, to give her peace and patience. Come out now. Come out. Come all the way out. I command you, I separate you one from another. I forbid you to aid and to bed one another. Come out. There you go. Come out of there. Physically exhausted. Come out. Always being tired, never finding any rest. Come out of there right now. Come out of there. Come out of there. Drive him out. You got the anointing. Come, there he goes. Come on out of there. Come out of there right now. All the guilt, all the offense from bad men, all the offense and the fears of the pressure of financial loss. The financial struggles. Come out of there right now. Wondering where God is. Wondering where the next opportunity to prosper, to pay the bills. Just trying to make it happen. Come out right now, you devourer. You're trying to block the blessings with doubt and unbelief. I command you to come out. Doubt and unbelief. Come out right now. Come out. Take come, out. come all the way out. It's time, devil. Come out of there right now. Come out of there right now. It's time right now in Jesus' name. It's time right now. Come out of there right now. Come out of there. Come out of there, you compromiser. Come out of there right now. Confusion about God's word. Confusion about warring in the word of God to do the right thing, to overcome, to press through through difficulties, to keep believing. That's the war, to keep believing. Come out right now. I believe right now. I believe God wants me free. Come out, double-mindedness. Come out of there. Double-mindedness. Come out of there. Come out, believing one day. Come out of there, choker. Come out, the double-mindedness. You come out now. Come out of there right now. Double-mindedness. You come out now. Come out of there. I command you to come out. I drive you out. I separate you. Drive out now. Go. Keep going. You've got the anointing. Lord, I thank you. These are things that only you can do, Lord. Only you can make a man new. Only you can make a woman new, Lord. Only you, and we want it, Lord. We want it. These are things we can't earn. We just have to ask our Father. And I thank you that the answer is yes. I break the spirit of discouragement. I break the spirit of despair. I break the spirit of distrust. I break the spirit of violation, violating the innocence and violating the trust. I command you to come out. I command you to come out. All that rebellion, come out of there. All that hardness, come out. I forgive my husband. I forgive him, Lord. I know there's another chance. I know there's a better day. I let go of all this pain right now. This caused me great pain. I let it go, Lord. There's no fix to it, Lord. you got to heal me. I let this pain go right now in Jesus' name. I forgive him. I forgive myself right now in Jesus' name. Come all the way out. Come all the way out. Come all the way out. All those hardship spirits. Come out. Hardships. Come out of there right now. Hardship spirits. Go. Constantly causing hardships and pain. Mystery pains in the body. Come out of there right now. Come out of that lower back. Come out of that lower back. Come out of there right now. Come all the way out. Come out. That's you. You're an oppressor. You come out now. Causing the pain. Causing the fatigue. Causing the fighting. Causing no way out. You're a liar. God is the way out. His word is the way out. You're leaving me now. You're leaving me now. It's over. The abuse is over. I know it's you, devil. I'm going to use my faith. I'm going to pray for my family. I'm going to see the blessings. You're not, going to just, you're not going to steal them anymore. Come out of there right now. Come out of there. Come out. All those demons that came in through drugs. All those demons that came in through the new age. Come out of there right now. Come out of there, you poverty spirit. Come out, you're trying to make him spiritually in poverty. Come out of there right now. I break this new age. Come out of there right now. I break this new age. Come out of there, the new age. 
Come out of the soul. I shut down the third eye awakening. Come out of there. I shut down the chakras. Come out of there. Come out of there. Come all the way out in Jesus' name. Come all the way out. Keep going. Hey, sir, you smoke marijuana? No. Not anymore? You never did? I did a long time ago. Oh, a long time ago? For... Oh, what have you been fighting lately? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, here's, here's how he gets you. He gives you a problem. Your reaction was, I need out of here. Porn was the solution he gave you. So the reality is you're... Yeah, he's a liar. You got a, you're a new man in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. But if you're going to be a new creation, you have to have new thoughts put in your mind. God's thoughts. God's thought is he wants to help you. God's thought is he's given you the power to be victorious over the devil and over the lies and over the manipulation of our flesh. You can let it all go right now. Just say this, Lord Jesus, I forgive myself, Lord. I apologize anytime I ever curse myself. I apologize any time I ever curse myself. I thank you for forgiving me, Lord. I repent. I repent of doubt and unbelief. I repent of self-hatred. I repent of hating other people. And I repent of treating these women like this with lust and porn. Treating them like an object. Please forgive me, Lord. I've been hurting people. Every click, every view is causing pain. I apologize to you in Jesus' name. I want my mind back, Lord. I know you've got a hope and a future for me. I want that hope. I thank you that hope is poured out of my heart through Christ Jesus. I believe, Lord. I believe. Thank you, Lord. I want my mind back. I bind this devil that came in to take his mind. All this confusion that came in through rock and roll, all this confusion that came in through lies and television and music, I bind your power. Every word curse that was ever spoken over him, I bind your power. I bind this grip of lust and perversion in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. I separate you one from another. I forbid you to aid and abed one another. I command you to come out now as your name is called. Come out of there. Come out of there. All these spirits that make him timid to the promises of God. Come out of there. There he goes. Come out of there. Come out of there. Spiritual timidity. When it's time to fight, we stand up. Come out right now. He's not rejected. Come out of there right now. Rejection is over when he was called by God. Come out of there right now. Childhood wounds of rejection. Come out of there right now. Childhood wounds of rejection. I command you to come out. Come out of there right now. Come out of there. Hey, Donald, can you switch with me? Come out of there right now. Keep helping this man. He's getting these spirits out. They're trying to take his mind. There were childhood wounds of rejection, and they've been belittling him. Just don't swallow any of that. It's toxic. Just spit whatever's in your mouth. Come out of there. All that bitterness. All that bitterness towards himself. All that bitterness towards people that keep betraying him. Come out of there right now. Come out of there. Those days are over. He's going to walk in victory. Come out of there. All that porn is over. Come out now. Come out of there. Come out of there. Come out of there. All those gambling demons. Come out of there. Gambling demons. All the curses from oppressing people with poverty through gambling. I command you to come out. I command you to come out. I command you to come out. Come out of there. Send the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Send the anointing, Lord. Thank you for the power of Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus. Come out of there. I command this tightness and this oppression. Loose right now. Loose right now. Hey, sir, what do you, I'll turn this mic off. What do you think you needed? 